All right, part two, narration of children. So we're going to start here by talking about reflux, gastroesophageal reflux. And we don't really call it GERD when it's a kid. We just call it reflux. And um, a lot of times this is related to um, relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter, just like it is in adults. Um, and remember that, you know, babies spit up. That's normal. Um, and so, you know, that's not a, this is, this is something that, all babies have is is this uh, you know that opening in that lower esophageal sphincter, um, but it is uh, you know as they um, if they reflux too much and if they don't grow out of it at that point we've we've got more of a problem. Um, it could be because the pylorus is tight and maybe there's too much food in the stomach, um, and then we also know that it's an issue um, if they. It, if they lay down um, to do to because they could aspirate and we know that this can be part of the issue um, uh, this this can be part of the issue with with SIDS with sudden infant death syndrome is actually aspiration of stomach contents so um, when we have treating this so um, we do have medications, we will give them um, some of the H2 blockers similar um, similar to what we give adults. Um, but we also will lift them so that their head's higher than their stomach. So it's kind of the same thing as we do with adults. I mean, I, I mentioned um, that my dad elevated the head of his bed to help with his GERD. Um, and so that's, you know, that is something that they'll do. Now, they have to make sure that there's not something more serious going on. And so they will actually evaluate them by doing a, um, they don't put a scope down usually, not, not to begin with, but they'll have them do this barium swallow, which is where they, um, where they actually have them drink formula that has some barium added, which is, um, which is a radiopaque solution. And they take x-rays to see if there's something um, congenital, congenitally malformed that is causing it. Um, and if so, then they do have to surgically correct that. Um, but the problem, the problem is often just, um, you know, a weak, a weak um, esophageal sphincter that just doesn't, it just didn't tighten up as they soon enough. Um, and so we'll do things like this where we elevate um, the crib and they, you know, you can lower, so you lower the mattresses on cribs. And so I know that we did this with, um, we did this with Alex when she was a baby, we lowered one side of it and her head was always on this side, um, until she could start moving around and then it's dangerous. Um, they make things like this. You're not, you know, clearly you can't put them inside a crib, um, but you can put them in like a, you can, you can sit them in, um, you know, a swing or something after they eat and, you know, and, so that they're they're more vertical. All right, cystic fibrosis. So cystic fibrosis is an autosomal recessive disease, and it affects a lot of organs. Okay, typically we're looking at your GI tract and your lungs as being the big issues. Um, in your lungs, we already talked about the respiratory effects of CF. Now we're going to focus more on the digestive effects of CF. Okay. Um, so when you have that sodium chloride um, imbalance, when you have that, um, uh, the weirdness with those particular electrolytes, um, your digestive enzymes get super, super, super thick. And as a result, lots of things get blocked. You can't digest food. And so um, they have a, they have a failure to they have a failure to grow and thrive. They so some of the the babies are brought in with failure to thrive. Um, the people with cystic fibrosis are often a lot smaller. Um, they don't get very tall. They don't gain weight, um, and that's all a nutritional deficiency. So often they we talked about respiratory things already, but um, and lots of respiratory treatments. But they need GI treatments as well, and a lot of them are on tube feeding. They need to take replacement enzymes because um, they they don't make um, once everything is basically clogged off they don't make the enzymes that you and I have um, that will you know to digest food and so they have to take supplements um, they're diabetic often because the pancreas is is basically non functional so we've you know lots and lots of issues. Um, 
So three basic things. You've got your pancreatic enzyme deficiency. You've got too much mucus in the respiratory tract. And you've got that elevated sodium and chloride concentration. And that's what's causing all of it um, is, that, is that sodium chloride concentration issue. So um, this one, I think I had this in the respiratory lecture as well. But I really, I li really like the cartoons. Um, and so you can uh, take a look at these. Remember that treatment, we are focusing right now for treatment um, on the enzyme replacements, okay? And we will talk more about those in the, um, in the farm um, lecture. But um, remember that for respiratory, we did a lot of like bronchodilators and stuff like that. Now, though, with treatment for, for CF and we're focusing on the GI tract, we're looking at replacement enzymes, we're looking at vitamin replacements, we're looking at, um, at nutritional supplements even because, um, well, especially because they simply cannot, um, they can't digest the food well enough. And so a lot of our patients have um, feeding tubes and um, they'll have a peg tube and then they'll do tube feeding overnight. Why do we do it overnight? So that they can eat normally during the day, okay? All right, so take a look at this. And then look at your GI symptoms. Abdominal distension because of the lack of enzymes means that the food is not going through. Um, they Because they can't digest the fat, they get the fatty stools. It's called steatorrhea. Um, they're often more foul-smelling um, than normal stool. Um, and again, remember I talked about this already with meconium ileus, that that's a trigger for us to look for CF in that patient. All right, celiac disease. So this is a, this celiac disease is a gluten sensitivity. It is an autoimmune disease. Um, we do know that it is genetic um, and it's, but it seems to be caused by a multitude of things. So dietary factors, genetic factors, and then your own immune system and what your immune system is doing. Um, it is seen much more in developed countries than developing countries. And so that's why we know, um, well, and for two, two reasons, we do know that there is a, a dietary impact on this. So the more gluten you eat, the more susceptible you are going to be to getting a gluten intolerance. And um, also the more we have more autoimmune diseases and immunologic diseases in developed countries than we do um, in countries that are still developing. So treatment for celiac disease is avoiding gluten. Um, the our celiac disease kids, they don't they are not going to absorb um, their nutrients as well. Um, so they are going to have malabsorption syndromes, whether it's from a um, whether that's going to be just anemia, um, it could be protein deficiencies. Um, so we have to, we definitely have to supplement them with things that are most commonly found in our grains. So um, like folic acid is a big one um, because folic acid is, is fortified in all of your grains and it's, and a lot of people find it difficult to get folic acid when they're on a, um, a gluten-free diet. Um, when you do have exposure to gluten, whether intentionally or accidentally, um, it will cause, um, causes massive diarrhea usually. Um, a lot of patients get nauseous as well. Um, the diarrhea leads to dehydration and loss of protein and all of the other nutrients. Um, all right, so when I talked about starvation, I said we were going to revisit it when we talked about peds. So there's two types of long-term starvation, okay? So um, you have your short-term starvation, which you basically, your body just, just fixes that with gluconeogenesis, okay? Long-term starvation results in either quashiacore or marasmus. Um, and so these are, these are protein energy malnutritions, okay? Um, so it, you have one of the two kinds. You have either quashiacore, which you have a very big belly, okay? So quashiacore with this very distended abdomen is because um, the, this abdomen is distended from a fatty liver, okay? And that's the one piece that you can, um, that you can distinguish it with, okay? The liver gets very fatty and it enlarges. Now, um, marasmus, on the other hand, marasmus is a deficiency of all nutrients, okay? 
This one is a severe protein deficiency, but not necessarily other stuff, okay? Marasmus, you've got a deficiency of all nutrients, and so we have um, failure to grow and thrive. We have developmental delays, um, and we're talking skin and bones here, okay? So Marasmus, your... Um, they cannot, they have a total intake of all new, a total intake of all nutrients is extremely low and it's too low to support any kind of like protein synthesis or anything in the body um, it, in Marasmus. And Quashia Core, it's just your, um, usually it's just the lack of protein. So um, both of these are long term starvation though. All right, so I mentioned failure to thrive a couple of times. Um, failure to thrive is a diagnosis um, in an infant or a child um, where they will where they either lose weight or they fail to gain weight. Um, they're in the lowest percentiles um, for um, weight, height, head circumference. Um, they will often experience developmental delays, okay? Um, we've got um, a couple of different causes. You've got organic and non-organic. Um, so organic, we can point to a problem, okay? So we can say, oh, well, baby's got failure to thrive because baby has reflux. Fix the reflux, we fix the failure to thrive, okay? Um, non-organic failure to thrive means that we can't find any reason, okay? So something is going on in the environment. This could be a neglect situation. Um, it could be, you know, uh, abnormal feeding patterns, but there's nothing that we can pinpoint as the cause. So there's no way for us to fix it unless we figure out what's going on. All right, necrotizing enterocolitis. Um, so this is your most common GI emergency in the newborn. And most of the time when some when um, you've got an infant who has this, it is because they were premature, okay? So their intestines, their gut didn't develop enough. And you have, um, and so the, the, in the immune system didn't develop enough. Um, so the intestines aren't working right. Um, you have less blood flow to them just simply because of the lack of development. And um, what basically happens then is that part of the intestines get a lack of blood flow and get ischemic. Now, if something gets ischemic, then it's going to get necrotic where it's actually um, where you've got, you know, where it's dying. So, um, it, you know, and this is, we're going to see this with usually preterm babies. Um, we can, this can also, um, become a factor if they advance the baby's diet too soon, um, to solid foods, or if they give, um, cow's milk, um, to babies too soon rather than formula or breast milk. Okay, all of those things are our triggers, but our big one is, the, the big one is prematurity. Um, so when you have a baby with this, um, they are going to have a distended abdomen. Um, and if the bowel perforates, they're going to be in extreme pain. Um, and they are going to be septic because now you've got intestinal contents inside the rest of the body, inside the peritoneal cavity, okay? Um, they are also going to have bloody stools, and, and we're talking like a lot of blood, okay? So this is the necrotic area here. You can see um, that this is all blackened because it didn't get enough oxygen. Um, and now you've got a spot here that is opened up, okay? So you've got a perforation here. Um, and so they make them NPO. They will put um, an NG tube in to suck the, um, suck the contents out of the intestines. Um, obviously, they're going to need antibiotics, and then they have to do surgery, and they often have to remove um, the necro – well, they have to remove the necrotic area of bowel, and sometimes there's there's more necrotic than they than, than appears. So they have to make sure that they have only healthy healthy bowel tissue left at the end. All right, let's talk a little bit about diarrhea in kids. So when we have, um, you know, when, when an adult has diarrhea, 
um, you know, we're, we're like, oh, make sure you stay hydrated, make sure you stay hydrated, blah, blah, blah. And um, it's, but it's a little different because we've got stores of fluid and, and while yes, it is important that we stay hydrated, um, we can last longer. Kids do not have the fluid reserves that adults do. And so um, you have, so when kids get diarrhea, um, it becomes dangerous a lot faster, okay? You're talking about your fluid and electrolyte imbalances coming out a lot faster. Um, now, usually if um, if you're talking about a, um, a baby who has diarrhea, um, it, you know, something, there, something might be going on. Um, because babies shouldn't have diarrhea. I mean, obviously if mom had a GI bug and then, you know, and it passed around the whole family, that's different. Okay. But babies who are formula fed or breastfed, they're not getting anything weird in their diet. Okay. Now, if you're breastfeeding and you've eaten, and you've eaten something that, um, maybe baby doesn't tolerate very well, then the, then baby might have diarrhea. Um, and so that is a, you know, so that's an acute diarrhea. Um, rotavirus is just a, that's a GI bug that comes around. Um, you know, but if we're talking about a baby who has chronic diarrhea, we're going to be looking for some of these, um, other disease processes that we've been talking about because we need to make sure that there's nothing more serious going on. Um, cause like I said, a baby shouldn't have chronic diarrhea. Um, and the big thing there though, is that, um, you've got to make sure that their fluid intake stays okay. All right, so here is a here's some symptoms of um, of dehydration in a baby. So um, the eyes will appear sunken. The fontanelles are going to be sunken. Um, this you can pinch. Um, so you got poor skin turgor. They're going to be very lethargic um, and not really, you know, not um, not showing an interest in things, stuff like that. So um, always got um, always have to pay closer attention, um, especially infants, but children too. When you've got diarrhea, all right, lactose intolerance one of the causes of diarrhea, just like celiac disease. Um, so lactose intolerance again. Um, this is your this is the same as it is in adults, um, where they they don't have lactase. Okay. Um, and if you don't have lactase as a kid, you're not going to get it as an adult. So um, lactose intolerance. Now, remember, though, that we don't, if a baby gets um, cow milk before like age one, that we don't call that a lactose intolerance. OK, you got to wait until they're a, a year old. OK, um, but we have supplements we can give, you know, lactate is synthetic lactase. Um, which breaks down, which does break down um, lactose. So, but it happens in kids as well. So, all right, jaundice. Um, we did talk about jaundice um, earlier as a sign of liver disease. Now, neonatal jaundice, we will see this um, because they have excess, um, they get excess bilirubin. Um, a lot of infants do get, have excess bilirubin and all they need is some more vitamin D. And so um, you've heard of like putting the baby in a window um, to get sunlight. We use um, UV lamps or phototherapy. Now we can do transfusions where we, um, that way it reduces the bilirubin levels in the blood. Um, but um, as long as the a transient jaundice that doesn't stick around and that goes away with some phototherapy that's not dangerous. We do draw bilirubin levels to check to make sure because if the um, if you have excess bilirubin um, in your blood from for too long, you can get brain damage. Um, and that brain damage is it has a name. it's called um, cernicterus and that's when um, you've got excess bilirubin in the in the um, bloodstream that the baby's not able to clear. And it causes um, it causes brain damage. All right, biliary atresia. So remember, atresia, failure to grow. Okay, and with this, you've got um, you have the lack of development of the bile ducts. Okay, so your liver is making stuff, but there's no duct to um, 
There, there's nothing to, to drain the liver into um, the intestines, okay? Or um, it's possible that the, that the liver itself is not, is just the, you know, the, the hepatic cells are not making the enzymes, okay? So you've got a massive liver problem here. And the long-term um, long term treatment is a liver transplant. We were, you know, we just, um, and we can take one lobe um, and put it in the baby. Um, but if there's no, if there's no duct work in the liver, then all of these cells that are making, um, that are making bile, um, there's nothing for them, there's no way for it to drain. And so what happens is that you've got all of the, you've got a lack of everything that the liver gets to do, right? And so the primary manifestation here is going to be a baby who's jaundiced and it's not going away. Um, and it will be fatal if not, if not treated. And so um, they have to, um, so they do, so liver transplant is the treatment there. Uh, we talked about portal hypertension. Portal hypertension can exist in children as well. And this is just a reminder there. There's not really a lot of difference. Um, this is a, so you can see here, you've got these, um, you've got the varices here where you've got visible veins um, on this, you know, on this child's abdomen here from the, uh, and that's from that portal hypertension. So this is a, this is a schematic of portal hypertension here where you've got all of this, the pressures in here are just so, so big. And as a result, it backs up into the veins outside of the liver as well. And that's what you can see here. Um, that all of these veins, because they're, you know, they're trying to drain into the liver, but they can't because the pressure is so high. Um, and so uh, with that, um, the number one thing is finding out the cause, okay? Um, Got to figure out what caused the portal hypertension. Um, it could be a congenital heart problem. Um, because remember that if the, if the heart isn't um, pumping correctly and the right side of the heart fails, then it's going to back up into the liver. And so that could be a cause. Fix that. Fix the portal hypertension. All right. Some more metabolic disorders. So we talked about, oops, sorry, we talked about um, celiac disease. We talked about a lactose um, intolerance. Wilson's disease is um, when you can't metabolize copper. Um, and so this is, um, so then you get toxic levels of copper that accumulate in the liver and the brain and the kidneys and the cornea. So here's a schematic of Wilson's disease here. So um, normally with, um, normally what happens, is, so remember this, so copper is in, is in blood, right? Um, and as a result of that, um, you know, we do have to metabolize and excrete it. But with Wilson's disease, we can't metabolize it, okay? And so as a result, you get all these, you get this buildup of everything. Um, galactosemia is also an autosomal recessive um, trait, and it is a, another enzyme that you don't have. Um, is so, and it's the, and it happens to be the enzyme and I'm not going to read that all to you, but it, um, you cannot metabolize galactose. Okay. And so, um, so then you get, um, uh, you get toxic levels of galactose in your, um, in your system. I think that's this one, except that I can't see it. Yes, here we go. So they get brain damage. Um, it causes cataracts and enlarged liver and jaundice. Um, and then, and it's basically, uh, so again, this is with milk. So this is similar to lactose, um, but it's, it's a different sugar found in milk. And then finally, fructosemia is the lack of the enzyme that you need to, um, to metabolize fruits. Okay. So fructose, um, and then the fructose builds up in the body tissues. None of these are super common, by the way, okay? So just, you know, just to let you know, um, none of them are super common, but they are metabolic disorders, and you will probably learn about them in genetics because they're all autosomal recessive um, diseases. They just happen to affect the GI tract. All right, let's do the learning activities, and then we will be done. So which of the following is true regarding physiologic jaundice of the newborn? 
pause, answer it to yourself. That would be C. Physiologic jaundice is the normal jaundice. And so that is going to be, um, that's in our first week of life for full-term babies. Okay? So physiologic jaundice happens all the time and it goes away. All right, the nurse is teaching the parents of a child with celiac disease about dietary measures. In the teaching plan, you instruct the parents to take which appropriate measure? Pause and answer it to yourself. And that would be D, got to be super careful um, that things don't have added gluten. Um, it's interesting. I was, uh, um, one, of the, one of my, uh, I don't know, it's just a friend of a friend and, and we happened to be talking one day and she said, yeah, I was cooking. She said, and, and um, she is, uh, she has celiac and so does her daughter. And she said, did you know that powdered sugar has gluten in it? And I was like, oh my God, I, I, I wouldn't have thought that powdered sugar would be, would have gluten, but apparently it does. All right, a child is admitted to the pediatric unit with a diagnosis of celiac disease. Based on this diagnosis, um, the nurse expects that the child's stools will have which, which characteristic? Pause, answer this to yourself. All right, so if they're admitted for celiac disease, the stools are going to be malodorous. They are going to be, um, usually they're going to be um, pale, not dark. They're going to be loose. And they're going to have um, a large amount of them. So they're going to have loose diarrhea stools. So. All right, a newborn infant is diagnosed with esophageal atresia. Which assessment finding would the nurse typically find in this client? Pause, answer it to yourself. This one is something that I didn't really mention, but you should be able to um, think about it and come up with it. And that's B, um, continuous drooling. And that's because the... The saliva and everything that you normally swallow, it can't go anywhere. And so it, it comes back up. And um, the baby then, after it accumulates in that little pouch that is, is the esophagus, um, it accumulates and then baby just drools. Mother of a child with celiac disease asks the nurse how long a special diet is necessary. Nurse provides which instruction to the mother to promote dietary compliance. That is a, a gluten-free diet for life. There is no cure. The mother explains to the nurse that her infant is vomiting after meals. It's becoming more frequent and forceful. And during the assessment, the nurse notes visible peristaltic waves moving from left to right across the infant's abdomen. So on the basis of these findings, which condition should the nurse suspect? So vomiting after meals... It's more frequent and it's forceful, so projectile vomit, that is most likely D, pyloric stenosis. A post-term infant de delivered vaginally is exhibiting tachypnea, grunting, retractions, and nasal flaring. These assessment findings are indicative of which condition? So this is something you'll actually learn about in OB. Um, this is meconium, meconium aspiration syndrome. This happens when the babies pass that meconium stool in utero, and then um, they aspirate the they aspirate the the meconium. And so this happens when babies go too far. Okay, they're they're in there too long. So post term. Um, so you're talking about like a 42 week baby or something like that. Um, RDS is mostly preterm. Um, uh, transient tachypnea of the newborn, this is, you'll learn about this in OB as well, but this is, this is seen with like C-sections. Um, and this is not symptoms of hypoglycemia either. All right. Do some case studies now. Michaela, two weeks old, began vomiting after eating yesterday. Now she's got continued vomiting and irritability. They tried giving her an electrolyte solution. So like Pedialyte. She vomited that also. She's diagnosed with pyloric stenosis, and her parents ask you to explain what causes this and the treatment she will require. What would you say to them? Think about that to yourself. 
All right, so remember that's the obstruction of the pyloric sphincter usually caused by hypertrophy of the sphincter muscle. We don't know what causes it, um, but the, that muscle itself is just super, super enlarged and the whole sphincter is, it just becomes huge. And then the opening in between there is too small to allow um, the gastric contents to empty. Um, and so because it requires a lot of, of you know, it, the stomach won't empty very much. Now the gastric contents um, are there, you know, they're going to be expelled through vomiting. And um, remember that how we treat that is actually um, is actually that you enlarge it, right? You put that balloon in and you enlarge it. So it's, it's, it happens to be called a pyloromyotomy. Yeah. Um, so when we got to keep, make sure that they, that we keep her um, from getting dehydrated. All right. Ricky is six months old. He develops colicky, abdo colicky abdominal pain, irritability, vomiting, and abdominal tenderness. What's the most likely cause of these signs and symptoms? How would this be managed? Um, so with this one, if we've got vomiting and we've got abdominal pain um, and tenderness, um, most likely cause here is that intussusception where that portion of the bowel um, kind of folds up inside another part. Um, so usually you've got the small intestine that folds up inside the large intestine there. Um, so remember, we can use an, an air enema to, um, to that's, that's an emergency procedure that they'll do to kind of un, to blow it up so that it comes apart. Um, but surgical, but if that doesn't have, if that doesn't work, then they'll have to do surgery on that. All right, you're assigned to care for Brian. He's six years old with CF. Uh, what signs and symptoms do you expect to observe and what potential complications are possible? So remember, he's going to have problems with breathing and problems with digestion. So breathing-wise, we're talking about needing bronchodilators. There, um, he's going to have an excess amount of mucus. He's not going to be able to cough it up very easily. In his digestive system, though, there we've got problems with the digestion of protein, carbs, and fats because that mucus, that super thick mucus, obstructs the, the pancreatic ducts. So the pancreatic enzymes don't ever get to the intestine. Um, and then eventually they destroy the pancreas. So um, now you've got, uh, you know, a child who's diabetic because um, they don't, uh, so they they won't, um, the beta cells in the pancreas often won't work anymore. Um, and then there, because of the GI problems, um, then you've got failure to thrive with these kids because they're not getting their, um, uh, their appropriate nutrients. So you're going to see vitamin, um, deficiencies. You're going to see, um, very small statures, um, underweight kids, um, and they're going to have, he's going to have a lot of breathing problems and a lot of GI problems. Complications, the, the biggest issue there is infection with those patients. All right, Jacob is two days old and he has jaundice. Uh, mom wants you to explain what it is, why he has it, and how do we fix it? So two days old, he probably has that physiologic jaundice of the newborn. Remember, it goes away. It's transient. It's like, you know, less than one week old. It's okay. And that's just, it's just caused by a little bit of excess breakdown of red, of red blood cells right at birth. And that bilirubin is just, you got higher levels than normal of bilirubin. Goes away. <coughs> usually, so usually you see it. Um, you see it come out about two days, two or three days old, and it goes away after about a week. Um, if they're premature, it takes a couple weeks, maybe as long as a month. Um, but it is possible that is that it is something pathologic, and so we do we do check and and make sure. Okay, so we'll check bilirubin levels to make sure that it's just slightly elevated, um, because remember that if it's a pathologic um, jaundice, it could be. A problem with the liver. Um, it could be a problem with um, compatibility between mom and baby's um, um, blood types. Um, and so we, so that, um, so remember we treat it with phototherapy, but if it is a pathologic um, jaundice, now we have to figure out what caused it and fix the underlying problem. 
All right, last one. Maria is an eight-year-old with a history of biliary atresia and portal hypertension. What clinical manifestations would you anticipate and what complications would be related? All right, so with portal hypertension, remember you've got all of the, the, um, the blood system, the vasculature in the liver is all enlarged, right? And so things can't drain through it. So your clinical manifestations there, your spleen's going to get bigger, your liver's going to get bleed, going to get bigger. You're going to have those varices, and that can be on the, um, so you, you can actually see those on the surface of the stomach. It's also in the esophagus, and so those esophageal varices can bleed. Um, and then the, her belly is going to get big because remember, as with portal hypertension, with all that pressure there, um, that's the, that hydrostatic pressure inside the portal system is going to push a lot of that fluid out and the extracellular, the interstitial space there is just your peritoneal cavity. And so the belly's going to get bigger and that's ascites. Um, and then that increased ab abdominal size, then that ascites, remember when we talked about ascites in adults, where I said it pushes on the lungs and you're going to see that in kids as well. Um, if the liver is failing, you got to think about um, things like hepatic encephalopathy because of the failure to digest the protein byproducts. So all of those things can happen. All right, that's it with this second um, part of the narration.